So, hi everyone, uh, I'm Srihari. Uh, I work at Nalenso, it's a software cooperative based in Bangalore. Um, that's my Twitter handle, and that's Nalenso's Twitter handle. Um, so, <laughs> Abhinav and Ned and I uh, forgot to mention yesterday that we are hiring. Uh, so, there's that. Um, so, uh, let's go ahead and uh, start the talk, I suppose. Uh, that's the title of the talk. Read it. Um, so, what this talk is about is uh, it's about uh, modeling Carnatic music in code, right? Um, and it's about making a machine uh, sing Carnatic music in a way that's sort of close to how I would sing it. So, this is what we'll do throughout the talk, right? What we'll do is we start off with comparisons of me singing and the machine singing. And throughout the talk, we'll try to bridge the gap between these two things and we'll see how close we can get the machine to sing like me. What this is not about is generation, right? This is about um, synthesis, as in uh, developing the abstraction so that a machine can render music the way you'd want it. It's not about those uh, recurrent neural networks or deep learning things. Uh, that are absolutely fascinating and some things that I want to get into and I'll put a, fo a path forward uh, at some point during the talk. Uh, but it's not um, as much uh, about generation as it is about synthesis. So, um, what do you think? Do, do you think we should listen to some um, machine uh, link Carnatic music right away or should we do that later? Right away? Sure, so, so let's do that. Right, so that's a sample of uh, how it sounds right now, right? And, uh, yep, so let's go ahead and get uh, the, the talk started. We'll see how uh, we got there during the talk. So for the people who are uninitiated, um, Carnatic music is uh, South Indian classical music, um, and it's sort of uh, importance academically because it's um, sort of in the classic spectrum of things. And the reason why it sounds different is because of the presence of uh, gamakams. And what gamakams are and um, how they are modeled and stuff, we'll uh, go into depth during the talk because that's sort of uh, vital in uh, sort of modeling this thing. And how else it is different is that it's uh, mostly a vocal tradition in that uh, my teacher sings something to me and I repeat. Uh, and there's not much that's documented in the process. Um, and it's uh, mostly a method of rote learning. And um, other ways in which it's different is that it's, it mostly revolves around compositions. In contrast to, uh, say, the Western music uh, of today, uh, we only have about, say, 10 uh, new compositions every year or so. And, and so most of, the, rend most of co the concerts, as you'd see today, are basically renditions of uh, es existing established compositions, and these compositions, there are like thousands of them, and they've been written centuries back. And in a typical concert, like say 20 to 30 percent of the audience would already know the uh, compositions that the artists are rendering. Um, and during pockets of these concerts is where an artist can uh, express their creativity in uh, what is called manodharma. Uh, and we need not go into the details of these kind of things, I'm just uh, letting you know so that you get an idea of what this is like. So, why I do this um, is because it's sort of an amalgamation of two things that uh, I sort of am mediocrely sort of nice at. So, uh, I sing, occasionally I perform, I do computers, I write software for a living. And when these two things that, uh, that I do are sort of interesting come together, it feels like I'm doing something that's way more interesting. Um, and another thing that's interesting is that uh, I'm working on something that is sort of still in the research phase, so I'm not like innovating based on existing tools and things like that, but actually reading white papers and like looking at references of white papers and then following that trail uh, all the way. And I have dreamy ambitions, right? What I want to do uh, one day is sit at home and then say, machine, play me 30 minutes of Se Shankara Barna, which is a raga. And I like play it according to my mood, and then create some music and play it. And I want to be able to do that someday. Um, and like, I guess whatever I'm doing is like small steps in getting there. 
Um, and even today, I actually see a, a lot of potential applications of such a thing. Um, for example, I only have, say, the notation for a certain rendition, and I don't know how to sing it. Or I want to say, uh, how would a Veena sound if it played this thing? Or, if, like, I don't, I'm not good at Veena, right? Like, I can make a machine play something and say, do this for me. Or I can, like, say, sing along with it, and it won't get tired like my teacher, right? So, so that's um, a very practical set of uh, things that I see even today. And it's also a weekend hobby, uh, as in it's a way for me to uh, fill my weekends with. And here is uh, a graph of me doing things on the weekend, GitHub commits, if you can see the line at the bottom, there's just Saturday and Sunday moving up and down. Um, so what I'll do during this talk is uh, cover these four things, right? First thing I'll do is um, I'll give you a bit uh, of an introduction of what are uh, Shruti, Swarams, and Dragam. And I'll explain these to you with code. And um, I'll go into a demo, and the whole talk is more or less a demo, but that's sort of the first uh, demo in there. And um, I'll go into Gamakams, because like I said before, they're critical uh, to the synthesis. And um, I'll tell you how, um, what are the existing models of these Gamakams and what I've done. And I'll also put forward uh, a path for what I see uh, the evolution of this thing could be. So let's go ahead and jump into the first thing, which is, um, Shruti, Swarams, and Ragams. I'll just get some water. Um, so, Shruti is basically uh, what you can think of as pitch, right? Um, say, um, I'm a singer and say I'm, I'm male, right? So my pitch is, say, C, and um, that's what I call the tonic note. And uh, say, if there is a female singer and she has a slightly higher pitch, then her pitch would be, say, F or something. And whatever she sings will then be relative to that tonic note, right? So all the uh, semitones and all the frequencies will then be relative to that tonic note you choose. And your tonic note itself could be one of these standard frequencies, or they can be uh, basically any single frequency, and everything else is relative to that. Um, and once you, are, you have chosen a single uh, tonal frequency, you have the same 12 semitones within a scale, right? And that's the same as you'd expect in any other kind of music as well. It's the same 0 to 11, 12 semitones that you can see in the Madhya Sthai Sthanam. You guys are able to read this code, right? Right? Okay. So you can see that in the first column of the Madhya Sthai Sthanam, it's just a Sarigama Padani. And all this is written in closure, so that's like a plain closure map. Um, and that just says the relative frequency to the tonic note. Um, and you can see that each of uh, Ri, Ga, and Ma have like three variants or two variants and things like that. Um, and a ragam then becomes basically a combination of these things. Um, I'm not going to go into, into the detail of these things a lot. I'm just going to give you enough context so you understand what's coming up front. Um, and obviously when I sing these things, when I utter these swaras, I don't say Ri1, Ri2. I say, Sarigama uh, Padani, so that's abstracted in the simple swarams that you see there. And then there's the concept of thighs, which is analogous to the concept of octaves. So an octave is basically uh, your 12 notes, and you can have higher and lower octaves. So that's what you see in the thighs, and in the last column in the thighs, you'll see the minus 24, minus 12, 0, 12, 24. So these are the two lower octaves and uh, two higher octaves, and this basically comprises, uh, this basically can cover all of your um, composition um, within like all these four octaves. So, given this, right, given the abstraction of these shrutis, madhya sthais, swarams, and sthais, I can then, like, say, given a certain number of notes, know the, compute the exact frequency that I need to pass to my server, right? So, this is the basic abstraction that I need. The other, um, I guess, yeah, we, let's go into uh, ragam just a bit before. Uh, we jump in. So a ragam, like I said before, it's a combination of notes. Um, it has a name, and it has a scale. And a scale is um, basically a series of ascending notes and descending notes. So it's called the arohanam and avarohanam. And the um, arohanam and avarohanam, the ascending and descending scales, need not be symmetric, nor do they need to have the even, like, nor do they even need to have the same notes, right? So they can be, uh, not symmetric, as in the Arohanam is not equal to the Arohanam, and they can have missing notes uh, and be completely crooked in that uh, respect. So this is actually an Eden file uh, that has uh, all these ragas. And 
here's the far end of that file, here's the bottom of that file. So you have 17,000 lines of uh, basically just ragas, and I just mined this information off the web and I cleaned it. Um, but there exist so many ragas, just to give you a perspective, and there are like 5,200 ragas uh, with unique names that I was able to mine. Um, the number. So each raga can actually belong to um, a parent raga or what is called a Melakatta raga, right? And so the Melakatta raga, um, there, can, there is only finite set. There are 72 such ragas. So those have numbers. And um, if I belong to that raga, then my parent uh, Mela raga has a number. But for the purposes of uh, synthesis, at least these numbers don't really um, matter. So that brings us to Laya. And I'll go into this just a bit. It, it's quite complicated. And I don't uh, think this is very crucial to the rest of the talk. So it's OK if you don't get it. Um, but uh, let me try to draw analog. So Kala Pramanam is basically tempo, right? Um, and Jatis are basically um, time signatures in Western music, if you're familiar with that. So these time signatures are basically like 4 by 8, 5 by 8, 7 by 8, and 9 by 8. And columns are basically speed. So given a particular tempo, you can go at double speed or quadruple speed or so on and so forth. Those are the columns, right? So given that these abstractions exist, let's go ahead and, and, and um, uh, do a demo of what we have so far, right? So here is uh, Emacs. Are you guys able to see this? OK, and on the left-hand side, I just have some um, phrases just so that I can um, show these things easily. So this is basically a single map that reads off the file, and I can read a ragam like that. So it prints the name and the arohanam and avrohanam. What you can also do is um, say fuzzy find the raga. So what I'm saying is say find gaula, and, it's, and I pass the string gaula, and even though it's like a G-O-U-L-A, and the actual thing is G-A-U-L-A, it finds it. And it's actually slightly different from how you think of uh, fuzzy search in any other language, because um, this is like fuzzy finding in Sanskrit words. And the logic for finding such things in, in um, uh, like standard libraries is not uh, easy. And I can go into that in more detail if you want. And like this could be like another draga. And uh, you'll see that it has an alt priority. That's because it has duplicates in the way uh, people have um, understood it. Um, so let's go ahead and play a raga, right? Let's play it. And here's how it sounds. Right? So what it does is just plays the arohanam and avrohanam after each other. Let's play another raga. And th that's the name. Like, that's Bilahari and this is uh, Todi. And then what you can do is you can play phrases, right? So given a swara, I can tell it uh, the duration for which I should play it, right? So the previous thing was just playing each thing for the exact same um, uh, time, right? So let's listen to this, right? So what I can also do here is uh, quickly change uh, the speed, right? So that's uh, rather easy. Uh, and let me go to my next snippet, which is slightly more interesting. Right. So what I have done, now you can see that these swaras no longer have the one, two, three thing. Right? They are just placed simple swaras. And the actual position of these swaras is interpreted based on the ragam. So I also give it a ragam. In this case, it's Kalyani. So let's listen to how it sounds. Right? And here is like one of the things that make you really think. Right? So it's the exact same phrase, but in a different raga. Right? And suddenly it sounds so much different. And for me as a musician to get um, like used to another raga, really understand it, and then sing the same phrase in another raga, it needs like some mind-bending exercise, which is not easy to do. For a machine, it's nothing. Right? You can just do it without uh, thinking about it twice. Um, yeah. So, and so that brings us to uh, more and more uh, higher abstractions and slightly more interesting things. So here is, for example, what uh, I would call prescriptive notation. And so this is basically what uh, my teacher would say, write to me and give and say, so this is how it looks, right? It's like, like sa, and then there's question mark, question, like, kama, kama. So that means, like, uh, it's played for uh, three uh, durations, so on and so forth. 
So let's listen to how uh, that thing sounds. That happened, sorry. Um, so the logical next step would be to like sort of read this from a file, right? And at this time, say this is like the Mohana Varna, and I can just basically play off the file. Right, so that's basically rendering that entire file like sort of cluelessly, like give me the prescriptive notation and I'm gonna play it. Uh, so that's that, and with that, uh, we'll come back to the uh, slides. And I had a demo here of me typing it out in case the repl thing failed here for some reason. Um, so the tools and libraries that I've used here are uh, fairly straightforward. Super Collider is the synthesis server that uh, gets started up once I start my overtone console. And um, the instrument here actually is like very trivial. Um, so if I, so if this instrument here is, is what this all is rendering on and it's a simple saw wave, right? Um, and it like takes a given frequency and it plays it for a given duration. So there's like absolutely nothing interesting, uh, not nothing, very interesting about that. And of course, I'm using like overtone envelopes and things like that. I'll come to that in a bit. Um, and the phrases for each, like I'm telling you what durations to play and things like that. And that is a library called Leipzig that's built on top of overtone. Uh, and I use that. And for the fuzzy search, I'm just using Postgres because it just works. Um, so, so far what we have done, what we've been able to do is we've been able to play a raga, right? We have been able to fuzzy find a raga because that's kind of interesting. We have a phrase, uh, we have a database of ragas. And then uh, we've been able to play a phrase and we've been able to play a phrase in a particular raga. And we've also been able to play some uh, prescriptive notation, right? But you'll all know, like anybody with any kind of Carnatic music knowledge will let you know that that obviously doesn't sound like Carnatic music. Um, but what is different, right? And what's different in a way that we can all understand it? So here's the way uh, in which we can actually see this, right? So these are pitch graphs. So this is basically frequency versus time, right? And at the top is me singing, and at the bottom is the machine singing the exact same thing. So let's go ahead and, and so you can see the differences, right? Like visually, you can see the differences. Let's hear it now. Here, here's me singing. <laughs> right, and here's the machine singing the exact same thing. That's obviously not the same thing, and you can clearly see that it's not. Let's listen to another phrase, right? Uh, and this is some, like, slightly um, more closer looking phrases. So if you look at the last part, there's like a Batman-like looking thing, and then there's a descent. Um, so those parts actually match up uh, pretty close, right? So let's, let's go ahead and listen to this and see uh, how or why it sounds closer. Here's me. And here's the machine singing the exact same phrase. Right? So you can see that, uh, so one thing I did, that I did here sort of sneakily was change the instrument, right? So instead of using a saw wave, I think something fall down from the top. I don't know what that is. Um, so um, one thing that I sneakily did there was change the instrument. So I changed it from a saw wave to a sine wave. So it sounds slightly more soft. Um, but still, like you can see that this phrase at the bottom is basically just squarish, and you have like steps, and there's no curves like there is in uh, my voice. Um, so what is this difference, right? And you can see this difference in uh, this. So this is just a hand-drawn version that I did that illustrates the difference. So the, the slide, the notation on top is prescriptive, right? So that's what I would write in my book. And this is a representation of what the pitches actually are. So I've just put a graph with uh, the semitones, so zero to seven are just um, or like semitones in between. And if you just look at the first bar and the first note, right, there is a single swara called pa, right? And that pa is actually a combination of three notes. It's not a single note. It's like, it's four to seven, or like ma, ri, pa, right? 
So that is just lost in the notation. But that's how it actually sounds. And what's worse is that when I actually sing this, I would actually sing pa. I would not sing maripa. So that's the difference between the note I utter and the note I sing, right? When, even if I'm saying that thing, I'm actually singing three notes. Um, so what are these things and do they have names and has no one ever talked about it before? They have and these things have names and these are called gamakas, which I promised I'll get to now. So uh, let's go a bit into how these are modeled and uh, how they're rendered. So gamakams are um, simply just continuous pitch movements or what has been defined, uh, like what has been like referred to often in literature as uh, microtones, right? Um, these things actually have names and they have abstractions uh, and it has been different uh, through centuries. Like Bharata's Natya Shastra has like nine and then there's like SSP describes 10 and then some other treatise describes 15 such gamakas, so on and so forth. Um, and well, that's the state of it and it's continuously moving. And the reason, one of the main reasons why that is so is because it's again a vocal tradition. Um, like for example, when, I, when my teacher tells me that uh, sing this thing, he won't say sing the, this gamaka, sing that gamaka. He would just say emphasize this thing or sing this more strongly or like lightly hit that note or like hit that note hard, right? And, and I'd understand and I'd like basically repeat what he's singing and, and that's basically it, right? There aren't abstractions that you understand. And um, one of the works, actually there have been quite a few works on this uh, since, in, like in the last century, but um, one of the primary efforts has been by Subrahma Dikshidhar, and that's the SSP or the Sangeeta Sampradaya Pradarshini. And here he actually has notation for the gamakas, and he, act, and he actually uses those notation in actual music, and I'll show you examples. But before that, so that you get a good understanding of what gamakas are, here are a few examples of me singing these things, right? So these things actually have names. Um, jaru, for example, is an ascending uh, gamaka where it's like you're just moving from one tone, from one note to the other, another note gradually. And it can be an upward or down, downward slide. Let's listen to Jaru. <laughs> right? So that um, upward slide you saw is called a jaru. Spuritam is something that we have already encountered, but let's listen to it again. Right? I'm actually only singing four notes there, uh, and I'm repeating each note twice, but the second note has an emphasis, right? And my teacher would say, hit the second note. Uh, but what I'm actually doing in pitch is that I'm going to an arbitrary low frequency and hitting the second note, and that's how I emphasize it. I don't emphasize it with volume, I emphasize it with pitch, right? So what the dips you see here, that's basically what is Puritam. Um, and another interesting uh, gamaka is in Urikai. And it's odd that something like this has actually been called out and given a name because it feels like it's something that uh, appears in a, like three, four ragas like Todi and, and Kalyani and so on and so forth. Um, but let's listen to it because it's interesting. <laughs> Right? So that's like a downward slide, but with a twist, with like starting from the upper note. Um, and the broadest of the gamakams is kampitam, right? And kampitam is where it's just described as an oscillation between two frequencies. These two frequencies can be any two frequencies. Uh, and the number of times you can oscillate between these two frequencies is also not defined. So you can like oscillate any number of times. It can even actually be three frequencies, or you can oscillate between them. So this kind of a thing is uh, very hard to model in that you'd have to like put in too many toggles to tweak uh, and get a better control of it, right? So let's listen to Kampitam. So that oscillation that you saw between the first two notes is what you call Kampitam. So um, going back to SSP, right? Um, so these are the names of the Dashaveda Gamakas that he points out and he actually gives them symbols um, and like each symbol corresponds to that name there and he actually uses it in notation, right? So here is, for example, um, notation in SSP where he actually takes the pain to write this down but unfortunately this is not how we write down music even today in, in our classes. Um, so coming to how we model uh, gamakams, I'm not uh, the first person to stumble upon this and want to do this but uh, you can see that like these are the two major works and one is in 2009, one is 2013, right? Given how long software has been around and how long Carnatic music has been around 
and like the tools to generate music has been around. This is like very recent. This is one of the things that gets me excited because it's like so recent and there's like so little work done. So yeah, let's let's uh, look at a bit about what these works are. So Gayaka is actually a software that's created by M. Subramanian. Um, and what it is, uh, can we take questions in the end? I'm really sorry. Like I need 45 minutes and I'm probably going to take all of it. Um, so what Gayaka has is basically a database of phrases, right? So what it does is that um, for a given raga, uh, it computes uh, all the possible combination of triplets. A triplet being a note, its preceding note and its succeeding note. And given the context of these three swaras, it figures out what is the possible phrase or what are the possible gamakas for this phrase. And for each phrase, it can have a list of such gamakas and it has the probability to weight each of them. Uh, and that lets you create automatic gamakas, right? In that you give it a phrase and it will probabilistically compute um, what is the gamaka it needs to render. Um, but that is very not scalable, right? Because for each composition, say, there are like 200, 250, 250 to like 300 uh, such phrases that you'll have to actually write down and uh, give like different gamakas for. And you have to do this manually for every raga. So that's definitely not scalable. So the more recent work has been by Shri Kumar. Um, so actually, both these uh, people have had comp music workshop videos and they are on YouTube. And if you're more interested in these things, you can look them up. Um, so Shri Kumar I actually talked to. Um, and his work is probably uh, something that has inspired me the most and like made me understand and like give clarity to all of these things. Um, and what he came up with are passer and depasser transcriptions. And what passer is, is a vector. And it's basically a pitch, attack, sustain, and release. So it's like the amount of time spent uh, in getting to the note, at the note, and away and going away from the note. Um, and he also did this thing called the depasser notation. And I'll get into that in a bit. Um, and uh, here's how, for example, Gayaka went about modeling its gamakas, right? So in the phrase database, what you'd have to do is you'd have to write the gamaka choosing like this, right? Wherein you say, um, like, the lesser than and greater than arrows say the pitch is moving higher or lower. And then what he also said that was very interesting was that uh, gamakams are uh, motifs not only in frequency, but in frequency and time. Which means that um, if I sing a gamakam faster, it has a different shape, right? Uh, so that's actually very important. Um, and he is modeled that using brackets. So the more the brackets are, the faster gamakam is. And how I have done it is uh, using overtone, right? Uh, so don't get freaked out by this. I'll explain it. Uh, there's a G inst at the bottom. So that's basically using the macro. And that thing is basically describing or modeling a single gamakam called the spurita gamakam. And this is a simple uh, dip that you saw earlier, right? Um, so that dip is basically a curve, right? And overtone envelope, so I'm, I'm using this term called an envelope and, you, and I call that function there. And overtone gives me that abstraction. What it does is that it takes a list of frequencies and a list of durations, right? So, and it, it's basically helping me draw that curve. And I take in, uh, so there's frequency and LF. LF is a lower frequency. Right? So at a frequency, and I go to the lower frequency, come up, and then I'm at the frequency again. Right? So that's the shape of my uh, Spurita Gamakam, and I can give that. Interestingly, uh, both Sri Kumar uh, and I have noticed that uh, the shape in which you move from each uh, note to the other is not necessarily linear. Right? When you draw this pitch curve, it's not linear. Uh, and so uh, Sri Kumar said that it would be mostly sign interpolations of sorts. and for me, what I found uh, was that Welch curve, which is sort of like a bell curve that overtone gives me, fits well. And here are, for example, uh, more gamakams that uh, I've been able to write like this, right? Which are basically uh, like the Jaru Kampitam. And I tried Passer, and I've just left it there for um, showing that I, I tried that. Um, but yeah, I've been able to sort of write gamakams here. Did, are you getting this? Right? So. Um, to put it sort of um, rather simply, overtone gives me envelopes. Envelopes are things that help me shape my pitch curve, right? Not necessarily pitch curve. It can apply to both amplitude and pitch. I'm using it for frequency, which is pitch. So uh, we're back to this. 
And so let's listen to uh, me and the machine again, but um, this time is going to be slightly different. So let's listen to me again. So this is the same Spurita Gamakam that you heard earlier, right? And here's the machine doing the same thing. Right? And suddenly you look at the graphs, right? There's this Puritam in there. Right? So, so you can see that that thing exists. And the way I've done it is um, my input notation is sort of a little inspired by SSP, wherein you prefix the notation by the kind of gumcum that you want to render that in. And I do use uh, the context of triplets to uh, find uh, what the next and previous notes are. So this is a slight improvement. Um, and for those people who want uh, to understand how, like, I did this in overtone and things like that. Um, actually, let me go back a bit to this slide. Uh, so this ex actually explains uh, a bit about how it's implemented. So if you look at the uh, last let block, um, it's basically a wave multiplication. So it's multiplying the, um, the modulation of the frequency and the modulation of the amplitude. So the first line is basically saying that my instrument is a single sign oscillator. And uh, I'm generating an environment based on the gamakam. So that tells me the pitch. And uh, as, far as, as far as the volume is concerned, that's the second line, right? That says that um, start my note and then stop my note after a certain duration. Um, yeah. I thought I'll get uh, a bit into the details of uh, overtone and things like that. But uh, I think I'm going to reconsider that and skip this and uh, come to this again for details later. So uh, the second uh, modeling thing that exists so far is called passer. And I explained this a bit earlier. Um, so this is how it looks, right? Um, that's, again, the prescriptive notation on top. What you have here in the middle is the passer notation, which is very descriptive, right? Um, and this is actually the exact same phrase for which I had hand-drawn the thing earlier on, right? Um, so take, for example, the pa, which was a combination of three frequencies earlier. So it's like four, two, and seven. You see that? So that's the first thing in the three vectors on top. So that says that uh, start with four and take two to come to, take two units of time to come to two, and then take two units of time to go to uh, pa and stay at pa for four units, right? And these units are relative to that row. And that row tells you pa colon two, says that you have to play this for two units. And all these units are, again, like relative, right? Like you give your uh, actual duration and tempo from the outside, and all these things uh, get scaled accordingly. Um, yeah. So the advancement that uh, he did on top of passer was uh, something called D passer, which is dual passer. Uh, and it's interesting to note that um, all these people who have modeled Gamaka so far have been Veena artists. Like even Subrahma Diksha was a Veena artist, and the way he describes gamakams were was mostly just uh, how to play it on the Veena, right? Um, and it's interesting because as a vocalist, it's hard for me to say that I'm starting from this swara and going to the other swara. But as a Veena artist, I have to like physically see it and do it physically, right? So that gives more clarity, I suppose. And how Srikumar split dual uh, passer was like, if I'm going to slide, I'm going to call it stage, right? If I'm going to bend the note, I'm going to call it the dance stage, right? So that's how he splits it. So he is split it between uh, the basic pitch movement and the movement within the pitch itself. Um, and and he's tried this out, and he's he's given like uh, theoretically much better results. But I'm actually yet to try it out. But I did try out passer. So uh, let's listen to uh, how this sounds, right? So uh, that's me and the machine again. Let's listen to me. Now oh, here's the machine now, um, but it's going to render it using the password. Right? So it's that much closer. Uh, and it's actually so beautiful. So let's listen to a bit, bit more of it. Uh, there is some prescriptive notation on top. And here's the machine playing that. Right? 
So that's it. Um, so you can still see that there are some phrases of uh, like squarish movement in, in the graphs, but it's kind of getting closer. Um, and here's how far I've gotten uh, until now. Uh, so that's it. Um, and here is uh, what I think I will be doing in the near term and the long term, right? So the near term for me is that um, I have the basic abstractions, right? I have the models for uh, putting gamma cast together. Uh, there's the passer and depasser. Um, and then um, I have the concepts of ragams and things like that properly modeled out that can take other uh, higher level abstractions on top of it. Um, what I do lack is uh, abstractions at the melody level. Right? I actually do have uh, some random music generation things, and I'm not showcasing it here because, uh, to be honest, it's not that great, right? Uh, because random is not how you do music. And uh, to understand how you do music, you, can, you have to go to higher level abstractions. And uh, fortunately, though, uh, Carnatic music has some higher level abstractions, right? Some ragas have rules in that, like, one raga is different from another raga just because of the presence of a, of a single gamaka, right? And that differentiates both of them. and then you suddenly have that thing as a rule to go on, right? That, that in this raga, don't make this movement, right? And these kind of rules help you uh, be within the context of Carnatic music and hence make more meaningful uh, music generation. Um, so, so that's what I think uh, we can do next, which is like use these rules and uh, model them. And then using these rules, you'll be able to generate better music. Uh, and obviously, like, uh, like recurrent neural networks and things like that. I really want to get into that uh, sometime soon. Um, what is, I think, uh, in my opinion, another like two, three years away is where transcription is right now, right? Which is the other side of this. Like, give me a rendition and I want to compose them into these abstractions, right? So that is actually uh, in a research phase that's a little backward in that they are like still in the phase where like, give me a rendition and I'll tell you what is the tonal note. Or like, give me a rendition and I'll split out the violin and, and the vocalist. Uh, and unfortunately, there like we don't have too many uh, stereo recordings of Carnatic music where you only have a single uh, pitch thing and then you can just basically ride on that and use those things to um, understand uh, patterns and pitches. Um, so I can't do that yet. But when that does come up in two, three years, I think uh, I'll be more than ready to take it up. And what I'm also doing on the side is uh, creating an open Carnatic music database. Uh, and I've already gone quite a way in that, in that I'm just mining the web for all kind of Carnatic music data. And there's an r4g4.com, and I, like, it's actually working, and I use it in concerts and things like that. Um, what it is is basically like um, all the information on the web, as in the ragas, compositions, composers, and everything, put inside a database and in a way that maps to these abstractions that I have. Um, so once I have that, then the path is like as simple as that, which is like, give me the data, I'm gonna like auto-transcribe it, and then I'm gonna feed it into my thing, and I'm gonna machine learn it, and then I'm gonna create music. Uh, not me, I mean the machine is gonna do that. Um, but then, right, if the machine creates music, is that really music? Right? I've, I've asked this to people, I've asked, uh, my friends about this, and like, how do you think you'll feel if a music, if, if you're like, your laptop plays uh, music to you? And you're like, no, I'm not really sure. Uh, and that has been mostly the reaction. Um, but like, their explanations is that um, the, sometimes the art is in the artist, in that like, it's how the artist feels and how the artist is able to express their uh, um, art or express their emotions and things like that. Um, and my take on that is that you don't really know until you actually hear it, right? So, like, wait until you can actually hear uh, machine-generated Carnatic music and then have a take on it. And another, like, uh, line of thought here is that the, mu the moment I tell them that you put some human being behind a machine and say, give them a few toggles to control how the music is generated, suddenly it becomes, like, so much more creative. It's like art. It's, like, similar to how we have electronic art today, right? Like, uh, or even like, uh, I don't know, these overtone bands and things like that. We like basically use the machine as an instrument of sort, more than an instrument maybe, but you have the toggle to like, you have like to tweak and um, fix the kind of music that a machine generates. Um, 
So I guess uh, that's it. And here are the references, and I'll put these slides up so that uh, you can see and read through the materials that I've read. These are mostly just white papers. Uh, there's SSP and then a bunch of um, other uh, work. The first thing there is though uh, my GitHub, wherein I like a single repo with all these um, open Carnatic music database things and whatever I've done so far. And that's it. Thank you. I'll take some questions now if I have the time. I have five minutes? Great. Absolutely. So Gamakams actually vary with um, the ragam. They also vary with the school of uh, teaching, right? So different schools have different ways in which they emphasize certain things and not, right? And these are left to the uh, expression of the artists, so on and so forth. But the very fact that these things have been pulled out as abstractions to a certain level, right? And uh, like if you're, if you listen to some Carnatic music lecture demonstrations, they will actually use these words and say that this is how this thing is. Uh, and they did use these specific gamakas to say that uh, like you need, like this raga is identified by these gamakas, so on and so forth. Um, yeah, so the answer is that yes, it does depend on the artist, but for a machine to generate music, you need these abstractions. And then if a machine is then expressive by itself and it has to be sentient and all that, then I don't know what that even means. Yeah. So, yeah, so um, the Gamakam's pattern that um, is in Gayaka, for example, the first thing that I showed you. Um, that is not, um, that cannot be extrapolated to Hindustani music, but Shrikumar in his PhD thesis says that uh, the passer and the depasser thing can easily be uh, expanded to uh, like Hindustani music as well. And you can, you, can, you can render it, like the model itself is not dependent on Carnatic music uh, specifically. And the ragas and stuff, of course, are very different and you like have, like, have a separate database for that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, my idea is that, right? Like, at some point, I want to feed a machine um, like thousand Shankaravarana renditions and say learn, right? And it would learn from the al alapanas itself, right? And then maybe it would have like uh, a style that's an amalgamation of all these artists and stuff like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 <laughs> right. Exactly. So I, I don't really know where to draw that line. Um, when I actually played um, this, this the last snippet, right, of um, the music that I showed you uh, to my friends, uh, and I didn't tell them anything. They said, is that a Vina or is that a Gotuvadya or something? And I was like, no, it's, it's a sine wave, that's it. I mean, there's like nothing more to it. And it's really indistinguishable at some point, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can do that. So I actually do have a random generation for the simple thing and the thing with the gamakams, right? As in you just pull random gamakams and then uh, render it. But to be honest, it doesn't sound, I mean, it sounds like Carnatic music in like in the waveform, you'll see that, oh, there are gamakas and everything. But the musicality aspect is not there yet, right? Like it's, it's still random to a certain level. Like you need to wait at, uh, like there has to be a phrase somewhere, there's a sense of repetition. Um, I can get it in rhythm, right? In, my, in the way I have uh, generated durations, I can like have an infinite sequence of durations for each of these swaras and make it such that every eight thing, it, fi it fits within the tala, 
and I can do that, uh, and I've done it actually, but that still doesn't contribute to the musicality of it. It needs to sound good, and how you get there is, is like going to higher levels of abstraction in um, something that's melody, and uh, I'm not really sure how to get there yet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so, huh. So, uh, each gamaka that I have been able to render now is actually uh, a triplet, right? I described this before, which actually does depend on the previous and the next note. Uh, and even within Gayaka, I was saying that uh, the phrases are built within context. You give a phrase and it tells you what the gamaka is, right? It doesn't uh, tell you what the gamaka is based on a single note. So uh, the context of the phrase is very much necessary. Also the context of the raga, right? That is also very necessary in that um, the basic notes in the raga is one thing. Uh, the parent raga, right? So what usually happens is that if uh, a raga is a janya raga of uh, a melakarta raga, it borrows uh, the bhava or the the way it sounds, sort of the uh, emotional. The, the how do I, I don't know how to uh, the the mood, sort of, uh, or like the flavor of the melakatha raga is borrowed onto the jani raga. So you can depend on that. And uh, like I was saying, there are rules, right? Like for example. Uh, in uh, Shankara Brana, you cannot uh, shake the Gandhara. But the same Shankara Brana, which is different from like Kalyani by just a single note, uh, has to shake the Gandhara, otherwise it's not. And if you know, you know that it's Shankara Brana when the Gandharam is flat. So you can ride on such rules. I mean, there are not many, uh, but you can, you can ride on them to like make something that's more sensible. That's the thing with rules, right? It It's kind of bad because it doesn't like it sort of sustains your creativity to a certain level, but that's good for machines because that enables us to like sort of restrict uh, it to sound more musical. Does that answer your question? Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh huh. Sure, <laughs> I guess that, that, that sounds interesting. I would like to get in touch. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, sure, why not? Right, so uh, Gayaka actually is an effort for that, specifically that. Uh, I, I remember that Gayaka is like a suit of small softwares. There's one that's uh, specific to a learner, where it'll like take you through the Sarali Genta and things like that, and it'll sing along with you in whatever pitch you give. It'll play a tambura along with you, right, and show you the notation, they sing with me, and then you sing with it. Uh, and Shrikma has built this Tala Keeper, which is also a software, which is like, it'll give, like play the Tala along with you and things like that. So yeah, these things exist, and like I said in the beginning of the talk, it's definitely one of the practical applications, right, where you can learn from music, learn from a machine. Cool. All right, let's let's take uh, more questions um, off somewhere else. Thanks. <laughs>